now I'll just say without further ado, here is Jim Janus. So when thinking about what to talk about today, people are, are still sort of mesmerized by this concept of China. And uh, when are you going to be right? Um, I heard it again at lunch and, and then just now on the TV interview. It's really a situation that is unsustainable. And one of the things I do point out to people is that uh, the greatest growth story of the new millennium in a major market, of course, has been China. The Chinese economy has nominally quadrupled in the last 10 years. Yet Chinese stock market investors, either uh, domestically or, or in the eight share market, have basically made no money in that 10 year period. That, ladies and gentlemen, is agency risk writ large. In effect, the VIG for investing in China is the party tank. And it's a big one. So, what is the China way? Well, it's all about connections, being careful, questionable numbers. I think that uh, we, we point out some of the things that, that, uh, that are going on here that, that uh, are, are, are you know, just obviously questionable. But then, of course, there's what you don't know. And what you don't know, you don't know. And increasingly, it's, it's a difficult place to do business. I will, uh, as a quick note, all of the sort of cartoons and illustrations in this presentation are from the Chinese media. So, um, so it's, it's not as if these things are, are not discussed within the country. The number is paramount. Like no other country is as obsessed with the actual output of GDP product. And in China, it is product because it's not based on final sales. That's an important point about China. But so much so that it's the economic tail that wags the dog. Uh, we have in, in, our, in one of our presentations a, a, a great Hank Blaustein, the illustrator for, for grants uh, of, of seven guys in a room and, and, and the head of uh, the economics, uh, the premier for economics is to say, well, we've all agreed that our GDP is 8% next year. How are we going to get there? And that's really what it is. Um, in an investment-driven model, the easiest way to generate GDP growth is to simply stick a shovel in the ground. It will directly affect your GDP positively. But it adds to all kinds of problems, not only in the actual accounting of GDP, which were discrepancies between the local and, and, and uh, national level, but just simply an overcapacity that continues to build all throughout China, not just an apartment building. The chart on the right is, of course, the, uh, the Chinese uh, fixed capital or so-called investment as a percent of GDP. And despite what uh, the China bulls keep saying about increasing level of consumption and reducing uh, net exports, and net exports have gone down since 07 from 10% of GDP to, to, to about 3% of GDP. The problem is, is that investment keeps going up. That, that the Chinese consumer, who is being repressed even more than the US saver, is seeing purchasing power uh, constantly challenged. The other thing I would point out is China is one of the few if only countries, and maybe some of the, uh, the, the guys who are much better versed in economics than I could, could correct me, but that doesn't put capital allowance accounts, or so-called uh, net GDP, um, in its accounts. So there's no capital consumption. So in an economy that has 50% of GDP is investment, and where actual real depreciation, I mean fall, buildings falling down depreciation, is a big deal, um, not having uh, any kind of capital consumption calculations means the GDP number can be highly, highly misleading. And what has this all led to? Well, I mean, you guys have seen the story, you know, Ordos and New South China Mall and Sky City, uh, the Shenbao, the, 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 the basic sandstorm of money is wealth destruction. I don't know if any of you guys saw the 60 Minutes story about a month ago on, on, on China, which I thought was interesting because for the first time outside of sort of the financial uh, realm and blogosphere, um, uh, our politicians and the public kind of saw what some of us have been talking about for three years. But there was an interesting postscript to that. The mayor of Ordos, the, the, the ghost city in outer um, Mongolia, which is part of China, which is uh, uh, just the poster child for, for too much building. It's a city for millions that is basically empty. Um, 
and it's still building. Uh, but, but its only other real source of, ec of, of economic activity is coal. Uh, mining it, transferring it into gas, whatever. But it's coal. Um, coal prices in 2012, benchmark coal prices, both net and thermal coal, were, were down between 20 and 30 percent last year in China. Production in the uh, Ordos Autonomous Region was basically flat to down. Okay, you got that? Flat to down, prices down 20 to 30 percent. The mayor got very defensive after the 60 Minutes piece, and he granted an interview to local Chinese media, and he pointed out that Ordos's GDP growth, regional GDP growth in 2012, was 13 percent. Okay, how does that happen? It tells you something about just how unimportant economically China's GDP. And by the way, I have no doubt, based on the amount of construction they're doing there still and, and finishing stuff, that it probably was 13%. It's meaningless. Here's the other part of the story, however, the flip side of the investment-driven model that I don't think gets enough attention, and that is it is credit-driven. Very early on when we, we talked about China, I would hear routinely, well, there's no leverage over there. Everybody saves prodigiously. And there's just no, no leverage. But as we heard from our morning speakers, I mean, there are some identities here that need to be kept. And, and one of them is there's a lot of borrowing going on in China. Last year, total credit, total social financing, which is basically bank lending, corporate bond issuance, and the so-called new gray market trust products, um, equated to 30% of GDP. Now that's down from 40% a couple years ago, but basically the 30 to 40% level is now twice the 15 to 20% of GDP it was uh, before the crisis. So as others have pointed out, like uh, Michael Pettis who's here today and others, um, the dollar of in debt, incremental dollar of debt is creating less and less growth. It's taking more and more. It's what you'd expect to see um, where, where basically uh, the developmental model is, is reaching its constraints. You've educated the people, you've moved them to uh, urban environments, more on that in a second, and then you've increasingly put inputs in the form of capital to work. Unless you start really innovating quickly and getting a lot more productive uh, soon, uh, we're going to hit the brick wall. All right, so this is a little bit on the wealth management products. Um, this is increasingly a source of concern for the Chinese regulators because although a lot of these products are sponsored and sold at banks and sponsored by banks, technically they're outside the banking system. So theoretically they're not guaranteed by the government. Now, in a couple of cases more recently, one was guaranteed of, of default, one was guaranteed, one wasn't. One was, was bailed out and one wasn't. Keep your eye on this, uh, on this space in 2013, 2014. The problem here is, is mismatch. These trust products have one-year durations. So increasing, they're being used to finance on the margin, basically construction at the local level, often for the local governments, or more ominously, in a Minsky moment, the interest that they can't, these projects cannot pay from operations, so they borrow more. But uh, as collateral is getting less and less and weaker and weaker, they have to go to the gray market to do it. Um, but they constantly need to be rolled over. And that is something I think not getting enough uh, attention uh, from the West is actually the duration mismatches in financing big wholesale construction of real estate projects and infrastructure, whatever, with in effect one year money. One of the big arguments from the bulls is, is build it and they will come. That 15 to 20 million people are moving from the countryside to the cities every year, that's going to continue until there's not a single person growing food in all of China. Couple of problems. Number one, while that has been true for the last 20 years, it's changing. Number one, it's, not, it, it's dropping off, but there's an important change occurring. And using the definitions of China, that as the urban areas actually grow, paradoxically, they're capturing people that were rural into urban areas. So the people aren't actually moving, or not moving far, it's just the cities are growing. Um, that is causing other problems, which we'll get into in a second. Uh, but more importantly, the stuff that's getting built, the people that are moving to the cities, 
who are basically the, the lowest quintile of urban wage earners in China, can't afford. They can't afford the 90 square meter condo for $75,000 in a tier four city before it's even furnished or the internal walls and plumbing are put in. They can't afford that. They can't afford to shop at the mall. They can't even afford the high-speed rail tickets. These are your lowest wage earners in China who are moving. So again, there's a dichotomy of the high-end stuff that's being built in these cities and those that are actually moving into so-called occupied. As we know, property is a linchpin. I want to focus on that top bullet point. People ask us, well, why, you're not macro guys, Jim. You guys look at companies and industries. You know, why, why China? And I point out that we, we as a firm over 30 years have had sort of large positions across a number of different industries um, that we've come at because we've come at it from the micro. We've looked at companies and, and like the telecom build out in, in, in early, uh, the early millennium, we saw that, that nobody was going to earn their cost of capital in the uh, telecom equipment or fiber optic for years and years and years. And, and things like WorldCom and Lucent and others turned out to be just great shorts across the board. Well, in China's case, it was our look at the mining industry in 09 that got us interested. I asked my staff, how is it that the miners like BHP Billiton and Rio Tinto and Vale can report record profits in the teeth of one of the greatest recessions we, we'd had in the last hundred years? Now, intuitively, I knew the answer was China, but I didn't know why it was China until we began looking at some of the drivers. And I'll never forget in the fall of 09, my real estate guy got up and he, he pointed out that as of that moment, in the, in the late summer, early fall of 09, there was 5.7 billion square meters of high-rise construction, offices and condos, going on in China at that moment or approved. So, I mean, pretty loose definition, but still. Um, and I, I sort of chided him, I said, Alex, you mean 5.7 billion square feet. Can't be 5.7 billion square meters. That's 60 billion square feet. And he looked at me sort of nervously as only a junior analyst can, was being you know, sort of questioned in front of the rest of the staff. And he said, I know, I checked it three times, it's 5.7 billion square meters. And that's when it kind of hit me. So if we assume that half of that was office space, it's rough, not a bad assumption. That's 2.8, 2.9 billion square meters. That's over 30 billion square feet. It was just on the drawing boards or in the ground at 2009. It's been built. That's a five foot by five foot office cubicle for every man, woman, and child in China. That's been done. Well, here's the scarier thing. The new number, apples to apples, is almost twice that. I mean, this is insanity. What's going on? I mean, and if you go to Shanghai and Beijing, you'll say, oh, well, you know, look, they built out Pudong. It was nothing 15 years ago. Now it's booming. Well, OK, but that's a little bit like saying, well, Canary Wharf was empty in the late 80s. And, and you know, it got built up by the late 90s. Well, Shanghai and Beijing are international global financial centers and global capitals. But take a look at what's happening in Xi'an and, 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 and really the tier three and tier four cities and elsewhere. Um, that's where this construction is really going helter skelter. And that's where I think the problems are gonna lie. So all of the things that, that, that drive from this, the fact that, that we know that so many of the units are empty, they've been purchased, but they're empty. One of the things I think is, is sort of interesting is my, my real estate team who does go over there all the time, by the way, that they point out that a lot of the, the high rise projects in, in cities other than Shanghai, Beijing, without a lot of Western residents, um, they don't have a homeowners association. There's no assessments. Elevator goes down, good luck. And, and then the other thing I always point out to my Chinese friends who would, usually when they come through New York, these are well-to-do people, admit that their family owns four or five or six apartments. They say, well, who's in them? Well, you know, my family's in one of them and my grandmother's in another one and three are empty. And I always say, do you know what happens to empty real estate? And I always get a blank look. <laughs> what do you mean? So remember, real estate's a store of value in China. Uh, and also, by the way, the real estate market's only 15 years old there. It's 1998, 99. Um, and I said, well, you know, actually empty real estate, you, you have a high rise that's 80% empty, even though it's 100% sold out. Bad stuff starts happening. 
you get leaks, you get mold, broken elevators, squatters. I mean, this stuff happens. It's not just maintenance-free stuff. Completely alien issue in China. Any of you who had empty real estate, you know what I'm talking about. What about affordability? Well, I mean, forget, again, Shanghai and Beijing, you can put as outliers. Just forget about them. They're, they're, they're the London and New York of China. But the problem is, if you look at the London and New York of the US and UK, um, you now have tier two and tier three cities, which are exceeding them in, in uh, cost of living from, from an income point of view. And even adjusted for so-called gray market income, some of these cities are still exceedingly expensive. Looking at the, the, the macro on manufacturing, a lot of the things that China was known for or was, was, was had, a, had a tailwind are now becoming headwinds. We were talking a bit earlier this morning about uh, uh, sucking in commodities and input costs. China will have issues. Increasingly, and by the way, again, remember these illustrations are from the Chinese press. Increasingly, we are beginning to see another issue raise its head. And while there's always been income inequality in China, it's getting worse, demonstrably. But it's getting more publicity. And I think that's an important new development. More and more Chinese are, are, are outwardly talking about the fact that, that the rich are getting richer and the rulers are getting incredibly rich. I thought the Bloomberg and New York Times pieces last year about the wealth of the ruling families was, was a very important development. Those stories, before they were shut down, went through China like wildfire. I had a team that was there in China when the New York Times story hit, and, and they saw it well, within 24 hours of it, of it coming out. So people were talking about this. They're openly talking about it. The wealth disparity numbers are, 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 are really something I think that's bubbling under the, the surface, coupled with the seizures of land by local governments of people that have been on that land for 20 years with very little recompense, um, and then seeing a high rise go up in conjunction with a developer. This is, this is fomenting under the surface and, uh, and, and could be a real wild card kind of thing for China going forward. Again, property is the focus. It's not easy for a mid-level corrupt official to uh, buy an apartment in New York or Vancouver or Sydney or send his wife and kids abroad, but they can buy a condo. And, uh, and, and that's often where we think a lot of the corruption is showing up in terms of uh, mid-level officials who are on the take. This is sort of a corollary of what we were just talking about. We're seeing more and more instances of mass demonstrations, more spent on internal security for all the talk about China flexing its muscles, and it is, uh, but more spent on internal security in China than, ex than uh, national security outwardly. Will there be real, real reform? I had a debate with uh, one of my ongoing debate partners last week at the Asia Society in Manhattan, and whereby this, this, this fellow who, who is a good guy and I otherwise generally agree with, um, but he's a little colored about China, um, said, well, you know, okay, the model is unsustainable and it's broken, we'll, I'll grant you that, but the new guys see this and there's going to be reforms. And to which my response is, why would there be? Unless there really is social unrest, why, why would they reform? It's in their interest to keep this game going. They're getting tremendously wealthy from the current system, unless there's change from, from, from below. And it's not going to be the masses' masses. It almost never is historically. If you read history, you know that the revolutions are not fomented by the peasantry or the lowest income classes. It's always the people right below the top who suddenly see the door closing. Those are people you have to worry about. So externally now, we're seeing a, a, a few more muscles flexed. The island issue with Japan, I think that uh, what John and others were talking about, about the lower yen putting pressures, it's going to impact China. Increasingly now a player in construction machinery and other places that China's big player or Japan's big player shipbuilding with Korea. Uh, you added a whole nother sort of ingredient to the witch's brew of East Asia and, and Northeast Asia. You know, there was the, the brouhaha with the passport maps and a variety of other things. Having said all that, if you, you read Chinese history, China does not have a, a real strong history of, of aggressive outward actions. They tend to uh, uh, basically prod and poke and have incidents, but, but China as a, uh, a military hegemic power is, uh, is something you won't find a lot of evidence for. Uh, 
um, China basically increases its hegemony culturally and through its diaspora. Um, having said all that, it's a different world now, and it's a much more complex world, and it's a race for resources. And there are some sort of eerie parallels if you're an armchair historian about what Japan was faced with in the 30s, um, increasingly ringed in by the US and its Western allies, Holland and Britain, um, uh, having choke points being monitored by the British Royal Navy and the US Navy, and then the ultimate, the embargoes and trade embargoes, um, with the way China sees itself right now, being ringed by bases, the US pivot from the Middle East to, to the Pacific, the uh, resumption of talks with the Philippines to open up Subic Bay and Clark Air Force Base, and then you know what's going on in Japan and the Korean Peninsula. You could see a China that would begin to get a little bit more paranoid. So we get back again to this issue uh, of really getting out and not just putting money out, but our, our bolt holes being created, our passports being picked up by, by, the, uh, by the Chinese elite to get their kids out and, and increasingly possibly themselves out. Keep your eye on this space. As people who know Latin America well know that, that not only uh, when the elites start actually physically moving assets and family out of uh, unstable countries, you have a prescription for problems. We're watching this as well. Um, there's a lot of ways in which it could be done. But again, we're talking about the very, very top people um, in terms of VIP play in Macau foreign passports, you know, foreign apartments, that sort of thing. Now, the cartoons are one thing, but uh, don't take our words for it. I mean, as, as we well know about the GDP numbers, I love the, the Bank of China's chairman pointing out uh, about the wealth management products, uh, that they're, to some extent this is a Ponzi scheme. And then uh, the, uh, the sort of stunning declarations on camera by the chairman of Soho China and China Vanke that uh, the that they were in the middle of a bubble, I thought was, uh, was interesting. I think more interesting was the, the, the chairwoman of Soho basically uh, pointing out the possibility, as the Vanky, of, of unrest should the property bubble burst on camera in 60 minutes. Sort of, sort of really interesting video. And last, before we do questions, again, thank you to our hosts. And if you guys can do anything for a very, very good cause, do whatever you can. Lauren is coming up here to facilitate a little q and I'll start with a question. Uh, can you explain the back, the back rack thing in uh, Macau? How does that get money out of the country? Well, it, what it, was it, the number again? I'll pull it up. It's yeah. large. The numbers are big. There's two ways, there's two, two sort of ways in which you can get money out of the country via, via Macau. The first is basically by being a, a VIP high roller. And, and in which you basically um, buy a junket, You're, you go to a, an approved junket tour operator, often a, a tour operator who has affiliation with the PLA or, or other government, uh, government arms, and uh, say you give them the equivalent of 100,000 US dollars in RMB. What you'll get for that is a round trip ticket, you'll get a three day suite at a hotel in Macau, and you'll get a credit for play, depending on the, the market at the time and the junket operator, 60, 70,000 US. So the cost to the junket operator is say 75, you just gave them 100. It's your cost, you just paid a 25% VIG to get your money into Western currency in Macau. What you do with it at that point, you know, do you deposit it, do you play it through, do you lose it? Nobody really asks many questions. <laughs> Good point. I think you got, a, you got a future as an ad copywriter in Asia. Um, the other interesting little, and again, that's sort of for the big fish. Um, a friend of mine who, who was in the casino business uh, uh, tipped me off on, on what the small fish are doing, and that's a jewelry scam. Um, and so you go to Macau, and uh, you go into one of the jewelers in the, in the casino, and you buy a brand new Rolex for $15,000 or 12,000 US. And you put it on your Chinese credit card, your mainland credit card. And the transaction is done. You then walk across the store to another desk and sell your watch at the used watch store inside thing for 10,000 or 12,000. And so you've just in effect in local currency. And you've basically now in effect done a transaction. It makes me wonder by the way uh, for everybody that says the RMB is undervalued, an awful lot of people are willing to do transactions. 
at a much, much lower value to get their money out. That ought to tell you something. Questions? Yes. Okay, what are some of your ideas for how you're, what are you shorting in China? Oh, you guys want to make money. Oh, what okay. are you shorting in China is the question. Okay. Um, well, the good news is, and people have asked us this, and what we're not shorting, because it's, it's highly impractical or impossible for a fund our size, is we're not shorting the US listed reverse merger son of Sino Forest, because they're just impossible to borrow, or the, the short rebate, negative rebate is too high. And that, that's just a given. But the, the interesting thing about China is that if you get bearish based on the macro factors, and I am, when you get to the individual companies, I'm like a kid in a candy store. They almost all look questionable. Um, very few of the companies earn their cost of capital. They certainly don't earn it all in cash. There's almost always transactions with affiliates that are completely bewildering. Um, there's often variable interest entities that you don't even see that, that where, where capital goes in the corporate structure that, 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 that aren't even consolidated. Um, so take your pick, but if, if you're as bearish as I am, Property developers, banks, cement, steel would be four places to start. And if you're afraid of doing that in the eight share market, where the market caps are big, stocks trade liquidly, you can borrow as much as you want, then look at some of the leveraged iron ore miners. Iron ore is a commodity, historically, on a real basis since 1900, has fluctuated between $30 and $50 per, per metric ton forever, from 1900 to 2003, just in a band depending on economic cycles. And starting in 03, it launched itself to $200, all on the back of China. It's now about 135. Um, marginal cost of production, still 50, 60, 70 bucks. So there's an awful lot of room on the downside for, for, for and iron ore is still 60, 70% of the EBITDA of the mining industry. So it, it, it's the driver. Do you look at iron ore and steel prices when you're looking at a litmus on what's going on in China? Well, you look at both. Um, steel prices uh, had a blip up, as did cement prices, as everything did in China in late 2012. And everybody said, oh, they're off to the races again. Well, no, turned out to be another false dawn. The government had local, local governments accelerate their spending into the party Congress to make things look good. That's already, we're seeing that dissipate now. And steel prices have rolled over, uh, cement prices have rolled over in China. Interestingly, steel prices over the last year and a half have dropped more than iron ore prices have. So the Chinese steel makers are really getting squeezed. Um, but I, I would be short both the steel guys and the iron ore Right there. Is there any ETFs that are short China that you trust? Well, again, I mean, you, you know, there, there are a myriad bunch of ETFs. I'm not sure that I like the ETF structure for being short. Um, and, and, you know, the ETF, uh, ETFs have, have distorted a lot of things. I actually remember in the discussion right before lunch, we were talking about the gold mining stocks versus gold stocks. And um, I think lost in that conversation was the gold ETFs have become the new paper way to buy gold, as opposed to the miners. And I think that's had a big impact on valuations. But, but when you have things like worry about, about the ETF ability to stay borrowed or, or, God forbid, the government coming in and changing the rules, you have to be a little careful. So I don't want to comment on any single ETF because they're all a little bit different. So I, I, I'll punt on that one. Right there. Jim, I have a, a shameless promotion and a real question. So I'm going to start with shameless. So do the real question first. Uh, yeah, question. No, go ahead. Do it anywhere you want. The shameless promotion is, as you know, we run the uh, Iris Zone Conference in San Francisco each year. And the uh, fourth annual one is coming up October 23rd. I hope you'll consider speaking out. You don't have to say anything right now. <laughs> I'm doing the one in next month in New York. I know, and I did your first one in London. I know. <laughs> but for everybody else, um, I hope you'll, you'll consider, um, it's called Excellence in Investing, it's affiliated with um, Iris Stone, it's October 23rd in San Francisco. So that's a shame to promote it. Here's the real question. Um, the property market is key. It looked like a year and a half ago the property market yeah. was cratering. Yeah. But then last year it looked like actually it's recovering. What's your view on what's happening? How do you track it? We track it, we track it like a lot of other, we started doing a, a, a database three years ago where we were pulling all the weekly data from the cities who actually do unit sales, not prices, but unit sales. So we started tracking that. Um, there's a couple cities that dropped out, but we have a database going back to 09 on that. And you're absolutely right. Um, what was interesting was that uh, in terms of units sold, and in China the units are, are, are somewhat uniform. It's typically 90 square meter shell. And by the way, I should point out, in China when you buy an apartment, 
that's all you're buying. Um, the finishes, the flooring, the appliances are all your responsibility. So costs are even, you know, it's a little misleading. The, the apartments are more expensive if you actually live there. Um, but it, it does make it for an apples to as a reasonably good apples to apples. And, and you're, you're exactly right. Um, the uh, sales of condos in terms of units started dropping in 2010 and actually bottomed out in the fall of 11 and then really began strengthening um, it, it late, late in 11 and pretty much all through 2012. Um, interestingly, prices did not. I mean, prices kind of dipped and then went up a little, they went down a bit, up a little bit. So despite this enormous demand back, you would think prices would go up, right? Well, there's the problem because what, what really happening is there's four or five apartments being built for everyone sold still. So the inventory is just, just still growing, even though demand, demand's back now to 2009 levels. However, interestingly, Patrick, um, the uh, um, sales now have actually flattened out again um, because it's starting to run up against some pretty comps from a year ago. And so sort of despite people thinking they're going to get in buy condos before the tax laws change it, property taxes or new restrictions. And by the way, we're not counting on house purchase restrictions or any of that affecting the market. I think that the, the government's going to fool with that and make announcements and they don't have a lot of teeth and it's going to be the market, ironically, that, that just too much supply that's going to swamp that market, not the government deflating it. Right back there? Well, so, so kind of carrying on with that, where, where does the money go when Property. It goes to money heaven, like it always goes. <laughs> Where does the money go? The Where does the money go? You, you had that, that question answered early this morning. Uh, you know, it's, it, there's debt against it. I mean, it, 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 it goes away. What about your short European banks? Yeah, we still are. What do you think will be the next shoe to drop in Europe, and why do you think your It's already are dropping. I mean, it's, it's already dropping. I mean, our, our, our shorts in Europe and banking system are... are sort of all the usual suspects. Um, and and uh, there's a, a real issue in Spain um, still. And, and uh, I think that uh, the one difference, I, I would disagree with one of the speakers who said, well, you know, uh, France is, is as bad as Spain. France didn't have the property bubble. So I mean, one of the, one of the interesting things, lost during the Cyprus weekend a couple weeks ago was a, a stunning set of figures that the, the, the the Spanish banking authorities put out that showed how much the Spanish banks had lost in 2012 on a preliminary basis. And it was a huge number, it was like 40 billion euros. And it kind of, it was totally lost in the shuffle. Go back and look at it. Probably data dumped. They put it, it out. It, 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 so well, it was, I mean, everybody was talking about Cyprus that weekend and the Spanish like slipped one in uh, when nobody was looking. Um, and it was just a stunning number that just tells you three years, four years into the crisis of just how bad the losses and how unrecognized they still are in the Spanish banking system. And as, as, as much of a critic of, of China's banks as I am and governance in the US banks, although I think our accounting is a little bit better, um, you know, it's both in Europe in terms of, of, of they're just not addressing the bad debts in that banking system and haven't. Um, and, and I think that, uh, you know, you overlay the Cyprus situation, which I didn't expect, but, but you know, you've got a real witch's brew of problems for bank valuation in Europe. Yes. What about the pollution problem? You know, I keep hearing, you know, the... Yeah. yeah what about what, the pollution problem in China? In China. I mean, I, maybe, going to play out? maybe uh, Michael Pettis will, will discuss this as a, as, a, as a resident. I mean, um, you know, it is a cost, and it's a cost that, that's not obviously being borne by the economy. I mean, China's GDP growth, again, getting back to that number that they're so obsessed with, um, is, is really gross in a lot of ways, uh, sort of um, in that... that there are a lot of environmental costs that Western countries pay because their populace demands it, that China is really not paying. Um, what the long-term costs to health and whatever, I mean, is a very serious open question. But if concerning us as, as, as investors or students of economics, we could also argue that, that they're getting a real tailwind to some extent by, by just simply dumping stuff into their air and water that that more advanced economies are more mindful of and, and pay for. So um, hard to quantify. Maybe, maybe Michael, uh, when he comes up uh, during Q&A, can talk to him. He's probably better versed on that than I am. One last question. You over there. Yeah, uh, same kind of question as, as he did, but uh, how would you, how would you uh, fit into what, what you studied in China with the demographic part of it? 
society in China. Yeah, the one-child yeah, one policy, and, and, and which, which may or may not change going forward, um, the impact this has. I mean, you know, taken to its logical extreme, it actually means that there's really not any net household formation, if you will. It's just it's moved from rural to urban. But it's not like there's in the U.S. a million, million and a half new households every year that you can count on for some part of your real estate coming. I mean, China, that's not the case. It's just, a, it's just different. It's just a transfer. So, um, but it, it has the same long-term, I mean, you can look at the demographic waves and starting about five, six years from now, maybe a little less. 16, 17, it's just the turnover, yeah. It, it, look, it, it's, it's an issue. And, and I think that uh, the government uh, is, is starting to rethink that, but it, it obviously won't have an impact for years and years and years and years. So it's something they'll be facing probably in the next decade, not an immediate issue. Thank you, Jim Chaney.